we're going to I'm going to give this about a minute here. It's uh, my clock is showing 11:59. Um I'm trying to be uh timely. Um despite being virtual, but we'll give it one more minute so that we don't jump into the substance until hopefully everyone is here. Um, just to welcome everyone to this presentation um, that's being put on uh, by the LACPA uh, Privacy and Cybersecurity section and also co-presented and sponsored by the Solo and Small Practitioner section um, and with uh, very robust participation from the professional responsibility uh, folks as well, which we'll tell you more about in a moment. Um, I'm just waiting for my clock to turn over to noon and then we will officially launch um, and I will do some introductions here. Um, and just from some housekeeping point of, for from a housekeeping point of view, you will be able to submit questions in the Q and A. So as we go through, please feel free to submit questions to us. And we will, um, if we think something is relevant to what we're talking about at a particular moment, we'll talk through it then, or we may wait until the end and do uh, a bunch of questions, Q&A at the end, last five minutes. All right, it is officially noon, so we're going to start on time. I'd like to start by just introducing everyone. Uh, my name, I'm Tanya Forscheid. I'm uh, the chair of the uh, privacy and uh, cybersecurity section of LA County Bar, which we just launched this last year. This is still our inaugural year. Not exactly how we thought it would go, um, but uh, it's, hey, we're, uh, we're technology lawyers, so here we are um, doing this with technology. We're going to talk a lot about that today. Um, in my uh, day job, I am the chair of the privacy and data security group at Frankfurt Kernet Klein and Cells, which is a mid-sized boutique firm with offices in New York and Los Angeles. Um, and technically, I am in Los Angeles. Actually, I sh we shouldn't even talk about where the offices are anymore. We're, uh, we are scattered uh, around. Um, but uh, uh, I'm thrilled to be here. Uh, I, have, I have just been thrilled to see the development of this section. And when LACBA brought this issue, um, the technical competence technology competence issue to our attention, in particular with respect to this rule comment that's being proposed on uh, attorneys and competence technology, it really did seem like something that we should do. Um, and so we, we put it together quickly in part with the help of our great um, panelists today. Um, and apparently my audio is cutting, and you're going to see as I do this that I have a very colorful cast on my arm, which is one of my uh, quarantine uh, developments. But I'm hopeful that, is, has that made my audio better, I hope, with that adjustment? Okay, good. Hopefully. And if anyone is having trouble um, with the audio, let me know. Okay. Or anything else. Uh, I'm going to introduce our uh, first panelist, Shad Muradian. In uh, 2017, uh, and he's the guy with the tie there, <laughs> in 2017, after nearly 10 years as a senior trial counsel with the State Bar's Office of Chief Trial Counsel, Shad Radian established a boutique practice focused on legal ethics, professional responsibility, and compliance, um, State Bar representation, and presenting continuing education trainings and seminars. So he is a busy person for sure, and he is a perfect complement for this uh, particular panel. Um, he also provides consultation to attorneys and law firms, helping them to find answers to difficult or complex questions of legal ethics and compliance, or to provide formal ethics opinions. Ashad also defends and represents attorneys who have been charged with committing ethical misconduct by the Office of Chief Trial Counsel. Today, as an expert in California legal ethics and disciplinary law, Ashad is sought after as a presenter by bar associations, agencies, and law firms. Ashad's mission to teach all California attorneys his real-world practical approach to learning and implementing ethical practices into everyday practice of law to help California attorneys understand that they should never be penny-wise, nickel-foolish um, with their ethics and professional responsibilities. And uh, that seems like a great mission to me um, and one that is uh, very important in our world today. Uh, and then next, let me introduce Andrew Lackman. 
um, on the other side there. I'm, uh, the way I never know what people's view looks like. They, they're both <laughs> sitting below me the way I'm looking at them. Um, Andrew Lackman is managing attorney of Lackman Law, a firm that focuses on innovation, corporate, and privacy matters for startups and small business. He has served as in-house counsel for Paramount Pictures and Realtor.com and worked with firms such as DLA Piper and Loeb and & Loeb on technology transactions and data protection matters. He was founding co-chair of the Congressional Tech Staff Association while serving as legislative director for Congressman Ted Lieu um, here in uh, Southern California. So uh, thank you both, Ashad and Andrew, for joining. Um, what we're going to do, just to give an overview to the audience of how this is going to flow today, we're going to start our first section of this presentation is going to be about Rule 1.1 of the rules of the California Rules of Professional Conduct and Technology Competence, and Ashad is going to walk us through that. Um, we're then going to focus in our Section 2 on sort of a technology competence checklist, which is, a, is just a way of saying we're going to talk about different kinds of technologies that attorneys work with or may need to be working with and what the various issues are that can arise with respect to some of them. And um, Andrew will primarily lead us through that. I may chime in on a few uh, issues here and there. And then finally, at the end, section three, we're going to talk about confidentiality and data breaches, an issue near and dear to my heart, and what I spend probably too much time worrying about. Um, at least pre-pandemic, maybe even post-pandemic. Uh, and I will talk in particular about um, a new opinion, proposed opinion from COPRAC. Um, and so, and then we'll do some Q&A, but again, if you would like to submit Q&A, and I can see that we are, uh, yes, people know how to use the window. Um, so please submit your questions. Um, and we'll keep an eye on that. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Ashad to talk to us about Rule 1.1. Yes. Thank you, Tanya. And so I'm going to go ahead and uh, share my screen now. I got a few slides that I can uh, talk through and talk along. Uh, so just give me one moment on that. And hopefully you're all looking at a slide here. It says Rule 1.1 Amendments and technology competence. Um, and then let's get right to it. So uh, rule 1.1 and technical technology competence. What is technology competence? Technology competence is essentially an aspect of the attorney's larger duty of professional competence. Uh, that duty that says we have to provide legal services with competence. And essentially the aspect that it keys on is that an attorney also has to understand as part of their competence the benefits and risks associated with relevant technology. Now, uh, sort of a background on this, this actually started as a national movement. So the ABA has its own model rules, which aren't uh, in, in use in California per se, but uh, model rule 1.1, a read much like our former rule 3-110A, and it essentially said a lawyer shall provide competent representation to a client. Competent representation requires the legal knowledge, skill, thoroughness, and preparation reasonably necessary for the representation. Then in 2012, uh, they decided that it's a good idea with the increasing impact of technology to go ahead and provide a, another comment or uh, uh, to Rule 1.1, which read, and I'm reading it here because the California version, which I'm gonna get to in a little bit, is a little bit different. To maintain the requisite knowledge and skill, a lawyer should keep abreast of the changes in the law and its practice including the benefits and risks associated with relevant technology, engage in continuing study and education, and comply with all its legal, continuing legal education requirements to which the lawyer is subject. So why was this change made? Um, there was a commission from the ABA called Ethics 2020 that actually did an entire overhaul of the model rules, and their take on it was uh, essentially that to understand the basic features of relevant technology. Okay, so we're not, they weren't going for someone to be, you know, you don't need to know how to code, you just need to know how to, what's out there and, and what it's for. Um, and uh, they also make the very good point that a lawyer would have difficulty providing competent legal services in today's environment without, for example, knowing how to use email or to create a document electronically. I think that's a pretty no brainer. But again, we're talking about uh, 
almost 10 years ago when this was adopted. And then since that adoption, 38 other states have adopted a similar or the same language. California wasn't among those until now. So that's why we are discussing technology confidence now. Currently, there is a proposal to adopt a version of the ABA's technology confidence in California. Recently, uh, on March 12, 2020, board meeting of the California Board of Trustees, State Bar Board of Trustees, uh, the approved uh, basically recommendations for an amendment to Rule 1.1 and put it out for a six day comment, which will end on May 18, 2020. Now, you'll see in a reference here to Task Force on Access Through Innovation of Legal Services, or what we all call ATILs in my practice area. So, this was a task force that maybe many of you have heard about that had many, many um, uh, recommendations among them uh, involving whether or not we should allow non attorney ownership of law firms whether or not we should allow artificial intelligence and machine learning type software uh, to provide essentially answers to legal questions, legal services, uh, and uh, it was quite controversial. And uh, although the final report came out, really right now all that's up are a few of these recommendations, one of which is this change to Rule 1.1, which is California's Rule of Confidence. And this is the current language. Uh, most people will be familiar with, uh, a lawyer shall not intentionally, recklessly, with gross negligence, or repeatedly fail to perform legal services with confidence. And then the following parts of the rules sort of uh, provide other aspects of that. But then if we look down at the comments, there's no mention anywhere in these comments about technology, uh, technological confidence. In fact, the word technology doesn't exist at all in the current law. So HL has proposed the following change, and you can see it now with the, the underlying blue language that we're adding a new comment one, which says the duty set forth in this rule include the duty to keep abreast of the changes in the law and its practice, including the benefits and risks associated with relevant technology. So as you can see, this is a little bit different than the ABA language, but it gets essentially the, the same gist of it. Now, why did ATILs, that task force, recommend an amendment to California Rule 1.1? So first, and this is their uh, justifications. First, they said it would clarify that an attorney has a responsibility to be familiar with and competent in using relevant technology. And which relevant technology? Well, that's going to be part of Section 2, uh, our, our checklist. But we're talking about, obviously, relevant technology to the practice of law. You know, the fact that you might know how to use Instagram or TikTok is not necessarily what's at issue here. Facilitate an attorney's or law firm's implementation of technology in their practices in a professionally responsible manner. What they're getting at here is the idea that if you're using, for example, unsecured email when you really should be using secured email, query whether that's a professionally responsible manner of using technology. So this comment, they say, will bring this issue to the fore more so lawyers will more think about uh, issues that, that we're going to cover later on also in Tanya's section, cybersecurity and breaches. Responsible use of technology could have a beneficial effect on law practice efficiency. Always a good thing. And of course, the main thing that it could lead to savings that can be passed on to the clients. So really, you can see where ATILS is coming from on this is the idea that we want lawyers to be aware because there could be these benefits. Now, what if this happens? Because right now, actually, the Board of Trustees is meeting. Uh, they're deciding uh, a couple different things. The comment period is not done. But ultimately, in the next meeting, it's, it could be the case that we're going to employ this comment. So what will that mean uh, for lawyers to so sort of get down to the real world practical aspect, as, as Tony mentioned in my biography? So first of all, will lawyers be disciplined for not understanding the benefits of particular technology? So as a former prosecutor, as the person that used to investigate client complaints and, and uh, prosecute attorneys in state bar court uh, and to achieve various levels of discipline, this is something that I always like to bring up because it's not talked about much in ethics. It's really what's the outcome, what's the consequence if something like this came in? Well, the first thing you should understand is that rules are divided into two parts. There's the language of the rule, and then there's a section, not in every rule, but most rules that say comments, as you all know. And the comments, and I just wanted to read this from Rule 1.0 sub C, the purpose of comments are 
that they are not a basis for imposing discipline, but are intended only to provide guidance for interpreting and practicing in compliance with the rules. So what I generally want to say up front is, since the change that's being made to Rule 1.1 is in the comments, there shouldn't be necessarily any compliance or enforcement change, right? But actually there is. Um, because the change that they're talking about goes right to the heart of what it means to be competent. So although the rule, it's, the comment itself won't ever be charged as a violation, uh, I've never seen that done and, and it wouldn't be done, it can be the case that you're charged with a failure to perform. Why? Because of some mis uh, application or, or, or uh, unprofessional or irresponsible use of technology. So there's going to be a new layer put out there. Um, now, this was one of the uh, comments to the ATILS task force itself. And so they had, a, they had a response. And their response, which I put here, was the inclusion of technical technology competence in the comment to Rule 1.1 does not establish a disciplinary duty independent of the professional responsibilities imposed by the terms of the rule. Rule 1.1 only prohibits a lawyer from intentionally, recklessly, with gross negligence, or repeatedly failing to perform legal services with competence. Unless the lawyer's failure was intentional, reckless, or gross and negligent, a single failure would not constitute grounds for discipline. This would appear to be a reasonable minimum for a public protection standard for lawyers' familiarity with technology used in the practice of law. So they're a little more flowery than I was, but they essentially say, I think, the same thing, that this is now an aspect of what it means to be competent. But given the way our rule in California is structured, you would need to do more than just one uh, failure or one uh, breach of this duty before the state bar could actually prosecute you. But the other thing that you need to know about state bar prosecutions is we don't know right now how the state bar is going to interpret this edition of the comment. So it could be the case, like in the past, um, some of you might remember the loan modification uh, era that we had five, six years ago, or a little bit more. Uh, and the initial guidance from the state bar was that there was a way for a lawyer to take upfront fees and provide a loan modification. But later on, it turned out that they're prosecuting those same attorneys uh, for that very reason, taking upfront fees, calling them a legal fee, uh, and essentially saying that until you complete the work, then you could take the fee, which was a sea change, as you can see from my brief description. And that wasn't the first time. There are many times where the state bar might come out with an enforcement take that is different than you might gather from just your plain reading of the rules. So that's why I say adopt a conservative approach to complying with technology confidence and really any rule uh, until we know more. And Other Ashad, I'm, I'm actually, sorry, I'm going to interrupt you because we do have a couple of questions already coming in and I want to make sure as you go through the rest of this section that you think about them. One is, uh, or say something a little bit before we lose track of it, one of them is um, that there have apparently been some negative comments on the rule. So to, to just make sure we highlight whether that those negative comments, what, what insight you have on them, if you're aware of that, and what changes might be adopted, if any. And then there's also a note that the rule seems kind of vague or the comment seems kind of vague and how can people comply with it? Right, right. And, and that, that's a very good question. And yes, there is controversy about this. Uh, our very own solo and small business section uh, in the original run up with the ATILS task force uh, was against this rule. Uh, and, and they said so in their letter. So there has been controversy. It's not, I didn't mean to imply it's a foregone conclusion that it's going to pass. So that's a good, uh, good uh, question there to bring up that there is this back and forth on this issue. Um, you know, another, uh, another issue that uh, I think was brought up was, well, is this going to disproportionately impact uh, perhaps those lawyers who were practicing well before, you know, the invention of email? I got my first email account in 1993, but, you know, uh, I'm sure uh, there are still lawyers out there who remember practicing before then. And even after 1993, there was still a slow adoption, I think, into the legal profession. So. Uh, there, you know, uh, will there be some disadvantage to those uh, folks? And I, and I think that's a, that's a fair point. But to me, it goes back to the idea of what does, what is the real uh, level at which your confidence needs to be demonstrated? Is it enough to know that there's something called blockchain and that it's used by transactional attorneys uh, and it has a, an aspect of security to it? 
and, and sort of a, a la, a, an ability for it to not to be tampered with? Or do you really need to know how to put something up on blockchain and use it? Uh, this is a question that's going to be ferreted out, and it might be ferreted out on one or another uh, poor attorney who got a complaint without any prior warning that this was a problem. And that's kind of what I was getting at earlier. And then really quickly, the other two rules, because I don't want to go over my time, that I think this impacts on, and we'll, we'll hear a bit more about this, uh, I think, from Tanya, is obviously rule 1.6 and the duty of confidentiality. Um, you know, now with technology confidence, if it passes, uh, I mean, if it gets uh, accepted by the Board of Trustees and becomes part of the rule 1.1, you know, uh, making reasonable efforts to prevent the inadvertent unauthorized disclosure uh, and unauthorized access to information, which is already part of your duty, will take a little bit of a different take now, have a different aspect, because maybe your unreasonableness is your inability to have used uh, available uh, relatively low cost technology that could have avoided the issue that you got complained on. Um, you know, make reasonable efforts when using technology and communicating about uh, with, with client about client matters. Are you uh, using secured communications when necessary? Generally speaking, unsecured emails, just a typical email you'd send from a Google Mail account, a Gmail account, or what have you, is, is fine for most things. But if you're dealing with something that's highly sensitive, maybe during a merger and acquisition, or as we saw in the entertainment uh, 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 inter entertainment industry where contracts and deals with certain uh, uh, performers are, are kept highly confidential because if others found out there could be a problem, uh, you know, that could be another area in which you need to make a reasonable effort to determine what's the best way to communicate about these uh, matters. And of course, to be ready for cyber attacks and data breaches uh, and simple things like, are you using a biometric or some type of multi-factor authentication? And then the other last thing I really, uh, last rule I want to cover, there are other rules that would be impacted, is the supervision rules. These are new to California, and it's the duty now that's implicit, in, uh, that used to be implicit, but now is explicit in rule 5.1 through 5.3. And it essentially says that you need to make sure that those attorneys that are subordinate to you and other attorneys that you manage, uh, as well as non-attorneys, understand the rules of ethics or they understand your duty of, uh, of ethics in the case of non-attorneys. And now that includes making sure that those same subordinate attorneys and other attorneys that you manage understand their technology uh, competence as well as the non-attorneys. Uh, and this also gets into the idea of when hiring uh, an expert consultant for technology, for example, are you checking references? Are you doing things to make sure that the person you're hiring is going to actually be able to help you in the way that you hope. Okay, uh, and then of course it, it, it should imply um, uh, reasonable measures regarding how access uh, to client information and how that information is stored as well as following up from time to time to make sure that those practices are still relevant or the state of the art. So that's my section. If you have any questions or need more information outside of this, this is my information. But let's take a look at the Q and A. If there's anything else, uh, doesn't look like there is. So I think that's it for me, Tanya. Okay, and there may have actually been. I am seeing something in the chat window, uh, which is to the effect of. Um, if someone, oh. uh, I'm just reading it. I'm not saying it myself. Someone said if we're an older attorney. Is it okay if a staff member is technology competent, even if the attorney isn't? Yeah, great question. And in the ABA states, this issue has been worked on, and there are clear guidelines that say, yes, using uh, a non-attorney consultant or another attorney that happens to know uh, can qualify is fine, uh, but only to a, to a certain extent, because unfortunately, um, uh, the rule of competence is non-delegable. You, you, you can't. Uh, uh, you know, uh, entirely, you can get help and you can make yourself confident through the help of associating other counsel, but there is some fundamental sort of nugget or level at which your confidence is all your own. So I think it's fine to get, uh, to have another staff member who's confident, but again, are you making sure, uh, you know, that, that uh, you're following up with them time to time and that you consider um, different situations? Because the rules for technology are not around, uh, they aren't, uh, the ones that all exist now, we don't know in California, yet, but the ones that exist in ABA are all fact driven. They're all about, are you taking reasonable measures to put it in a nutshell? Uh, so that's what it really comes down to. It's not about uh, technical parameters. 
Okay, understood. And so, and I'm going to say, so I'm going to answer one of the other little questions that's here, and then the other one is going to happen at the end. Um, but of, with respect to encrypted emails, no. So this this comment would not mandate encrypted emails. There's nothing, even in, frankly, the laws, generally speaking, in California, that mandates that all email be encrypted. Um, I will talk a little bit more about that too when we talk about data breaches, and I will also talk about the the this whole risk allocation question that's been raised about uh, the service providers and who's responsible when we get there. And so let's let's turn it over now to um, um, one to, thing, Tanya. Yeah. Uh, since someone mm -hmm. asked about the slides, I will send that over to uh, LACPA, and, and I guess they'll distribute it however uh, they can. So I'll do that. Great. Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely, thank you. Um, so Andrew, let's jump into our sort of technology competence type tech checklist and talk about different kinds of technology. Um, and so I'm, I'm going to let you uh, run with it. But you know what we what we want to do here is talk about different methods of use technology use, right? So practically speaking, in your practice, um, use of email, video conferencing for communication, document collaboration. Um, even things like AI and machine learning, um, cloud computing, et cetera. So tell, tell us, talk to us about your thoughts there and what attorneys should be concerned about, sure. what they need to know. Well, thank you very much. And I think this really sets, a, a, a sets the stage here as part of this discussion. Um, in addition to California uh, and, and professional uh, ethics uh, code, uh, or rules, I should say. There are also laws out there which directly impact what we do, and if you're in-house, it, it impacts you as well. Um, in uh, California, while there is no technical requirement that email has to be, uh, sorry, that you have to have security, the Attorney General under CCPA can bring a lawsuit against you under CCPA if you have a data breach and you have inadequate security. Massachusetts, its data breach law uh, and they have regulations that go with it make very clear and I think New York um, uh, recently passed something to this effect as well um, that a failure to maintain reasonable security around your data is a violation of the law and then of course if you're dealing with the EU GDPR is very clear as well that uh, if you're dealing with European uh, data from people who are located in the European Union um, that you have an obligation based on the sensitivity of data the rights involved to have appropriate technical and organizational measures to, uh, to protect that data. So with that sort of stage set, um, uh, there are a couple of opinions out of the California bar that impact on this. The most famous one is, uh, uh, is 2012-184 on virtual law offices uh, as pertains to the use of technology. Um, and uh, they just basically state that the business and professions code uh, the rules of professional conduct do not impose greater or different duties upon a VLO practitioner um, or someone operating in the cloud than they do upon a traditional law office. And so you have to use similar rules, um, which actually built on an opinion that they had a couple of years ago, uh, back in 2010, in which they laid out sort of a six stage vetting that you're supposed to do for, uh, for uh, when it comes to the use of technology of looking at the uh, the security attendant to the technology, whether precautions may be taken uh, when the technology, uh, it, when using the technology to increase level of security, the legal ramifications of a third party who intercepts it, that kind of sort of information, the degree of sensitivity of the information, the impact uh, on the client of an inadvertent disclosure, uh, the urgency of the situation, of course. Um, and then finally, the client's instructions and circumstances. I mean, I have. I have clients that, you know, insist that they only want to use Google Docs, which is, frankly, and as I said, you know, Tanya can can also accentuate, not the most secure platform, and you can only warn them, uh, and you have a, a duty to warn. So let's let's run through the the first and the most obvious one, the one that's been in the news the most, and that's been around teleconferencing. Um, and again, this is sort of a high level rule that for anything out there, but um, it, you know. It, if a, if a license to use certain software imposes a, uh, imposes a requirement on third party access to information related to the attorney's use of technology, then the attorney may need to confirm those tools. And that's part of the basic vetting that you should be doing anyway to make sure what information is stored. 
uh, a perfect example, and there's a couple of uh, articles uh, written by a, uh, a, a wonderful attorney that I know um, that have been posted up about what's happened with Zoom, um, where they were sharing certain kinds of information automatically um, with, uh, with their advertisers and their validators, uh, and that wasn't disclosed. And so uh, Zoom just actually, uh, they had a series of lawsuits about that, um, uh, which they just entered into a, a settlement over. Um, uh, and before I go over some specific tools, Tanya, I don't know if you had anything specific that you wanted to bring in on that particular one, just because I know, um, you, know uh, you, you wrote those two articles. Sure, sure. So, um, uh, yes, I'll just I'll mention that Zoom Zoom got a lot of attention because it became very big very quickly, um, and there's a lot. Yeah, people are there's a lot going on in the chat window here, folks, and we're going to try to address all of it. Just be aware, you know, it, it would be good to not distract people too much with the chat. Um, so we'll try to touch on some of this. With respect to uh, video conferencing, all of the video conferencing services, I mean, we're using Zoom right now, right? So beware that they're all going to have to collect certain information in order to provide the service, right? If you're using Zoom for client conversations, which is not the end of the world, they, they're not sharing that with their advertisers. What they were sharing with their advertisers was through something called the Facebook SDK which is a software development kit, which actually almost every company out there uses on their website, any brand uses on their website. And what it sends is device information to Facebook. Um, it's not particularly controversial. Where they screwed up, if you want to put it that way, is they didn't disclose the use of the Facebook SDK in their privacy policy. But that actually had nothing to do with the possibility of, of sensitive video content being shared with third parties. That wasn't what was going on. Since then, there have emerged other questions about the actual security of the Zoom service and whether, for example, using um, certain kinds of naming conventions for the meeting URL, not requiring passwords initially, which they do now, not automatically having people go to the waiting room, which they do now. Um, it was designed to be easy to use. And as with so many things, and I think as lawyers you can all relate, Sometimes people want things to be easy to use and then they get frustrated when you put things in the way like passwords and that kind of thing. So they have now made changes and they have settled. Let me just briefly say, because I'm seeing a whole lot in the chat window and we'll try to get to this later, but one thing I want to mention is uh, someone said that now that we're home from the pandemic, um, they have to forward email to their Gmail. That shouldn't be the case. Um, if you're working remotely, um, law firms, and there's some great uh, guidance out there from a variety of bars about this, should be using um, VPNs and secured you know, email through your, for example, and, and Gmail does have this, by the way, for business. There's a business Gmail function. You shouldn't have to use your personal email or to forward things to your personal email to work from home to print. You should be able to use a VPN or something like Citrix or another remote access functionality that has things like multi-factor authentication. None of this is especially expensive um, that will allow you to use your email. Yeah. Up. So absolutely. There we go. So I'm going to yeah. turn it back over to Andrew. <laughs> sure. I, I, it just shows how it interweaves. And I think, you know, uh, Tanya's points are very important. I mean, you know, when you're using Zoom or a free conference call or uh, Google Meet, you know, have passwords for all calls, have a waiting room, and you should also should consider so you can screen your participants and limit your use of video and recording options as well. Um, you know, uh, the, even, I, I even, you know, with, with my kids in their school, you know, at first it took them the first couple of weeks to realize that you should turn off some of the whiteboard functions because people were interfering with the presentations and that sort of thing. Um, similarly with, e with email, and this was very much in line with, um, uh, what Tanya just brought up. Um, there's a duty to protect confidentiality and communications from one's client. There's an ABA formal opinion, 11-459, uh, that deals with it. But a lot of this is, you know, common sense and how we deal with our lives anyway. You know, practice cyber hygiene, learn and train your staff about phishing, don't use public Wi-Fi, um, you know, you should always presume, uh, I, I, I remember when I took the IAPP uh, test for certification, 
uh, you know, someone pointed out that uh, a lot of the basic security that you quote see at these public Wi-Fi is about as effective as a chocolate firewall. Um, and so really doesn't help that much. Um, have two-factor authentication for your email. Change your passwords regularly. Um, and to what Tanya just said a moment ago, you know, consider a mobile device management tool uh, to make sure, number one, that uh, you can restrict information being downloaded onto a personal device and what can be uploaded off of it, but also what happens if it gets stolen. This enable, can enable you to wipe out uh, or limit use of a, of a device or certain parts of a device uh, that gets stolen. And there's also virtual workplace tools like Citrix and use of VPNs to limit exposure on the attorney end. Uh, with respect to collaboration tools, I mean, a lot of people uh, use a lot more tools lately, whether it's something like Practice Panther or Clio um, that we're seeing out there, uh, or just even a website out there um, and cloud storage. Uh, there's, there's now a, there has been created a, a much more robust you know, set of rules. Uh, uh, even out of California, you go back to 2005, uh, there was an opinion in which someone wanted to sub ask, uh, ask a, a family attorney to be their family attorney um, and submitted a questions in an electronic form. Um, you know, the good news out of that decision and it's followed since is that you can't create a unilateral, unilateral communication does not create an attorney-client relationship. Um, but having proper disclosures and responses to communications are going to be very important. Um, also keep in mind with these collaboration tools that as a result of uh, California State, uh, State Bar Opinion 2007-174, an attorney has a duty to make certain electronic files available and strip out confidential metadata. Now, you're not required to create new files for these folks, but when you're embracing and taking on a new piece of technology, do you have the ability to be able to export that um, into a form that your client can use if they ask for it? So here are a couple of best practices in that area. Uh, and, and by the way, this also extends to an extent to blockchain. As you know, you know, blockchain is a sort of a database technology which allows you to track changes so that in theory, uh, they can't be interfered and edited with and you can see how a certain uh, how, how certain fields have changed. Uh, it's not always secure. It's still very much a work in progress. Um, uh, you know, it originally started with cryptocurrency, but now it's being used in areas like public contracting and a lot of other areas. Uh, but it's, you know, it, it still has a lot of the same security risks out there. So here are a couple of things you can do. Uh, one is always include consents to use cloud tools in your engagement agreements. Include disclaimers in any auto response messages making clear that you're not creating necessarily an attorney-client relationship. Uh, encryption should be a basic in this day and age. Um, make sure data is encrypted both at rest while it is being stored and also in transit while it is being sent. It is considered, if you do not encrypt your data, it is presumed that you are not, uh, that you're not taking steps, uh, that you're not being diligent in the protection. Two-factor authentication and basic cyber hygiene you know, silo tools through virtual workspaces, VPN, and then having the security basics on your device. Have antivirus, have firewalls, update your patches regularly when you get them. That even includes not just your operating system, um, but, you know, your word processing tools and, and, and everything else. The, the, the biggest risk that people run in the use of their software is, after phishing, of course, is not updating the security to updating their software regularly. Uh, you know, if you're still using Windows XP or one of those more ancient technologies, it's even more important. Um, let's talk a little bit about AI and machine learning tools, because um, uh, this has been a big part of the discussion about this new rule change out there. An attorney still has a duty under Rule 3-110 to supervise vendors, and the ABA has a similar opinion. Uh, that was around e-discovery um, in, in that particular case. but when you're outsourcing any kind of legal or non-legal support services where they're not considered lawyers, you still have a very strong obligation to vet those things. And there was an e-discovery opinion from 2015, which says an attorney that lacking an experience and competency for e-discovery issues uh, has three options. They can either acquire the sufficient learning um, and skill before the performance is required, associate with technical consultants or competent counsel, or decline the representation. 
lack of competency in this area is also can lead to some very serious ethical violations. So, uh, you know, this goes with AI and machine learning tools as well. There's a lot of stuff out there that will allow you to do contracts of certain kinds of documents easier, um, but that doesn't relieve any of us from the obligation besides the basic security obligations of making sure that it's done correctly and that every, you know, and, and you know, dotting our I's and crossing our T's, so to say. Uh, it's not meant to replace us. It's meant to make our life easier and supplement, not replace the work that we do. Uh, so with that, I think I've gone through most of my areas of, uh, of uh, in, in terms of competence checklist. I don't know if the, uh, if, if, if either of you have anything that, to add to it. Ashad, do you want to jump in on any of that with respect to some of those other opinions out there? Um, yeah, there's a whole slew of uh, California, uh, both from the California State Bar's uh, COPRAC and as well as uh, our very own uh, Lake County Bar Professional Responsibility and Ethics uh, regarding the use of technology, regarding um, uh, you know, how this all implicates the virtual office blogging. There are various different takes uh, out there. So really the, the introduction of this amendment uh, is not in any sense sort of a revolution in California law. This is something that's already being developed because lawyers are using this technology. They're blogging, they're using virtual offices, they're, they're using um, electronic uh, d tools regarding in, in discovery. Uh, and in our materials that we sent out, there are about six opinions uh, from about 2010 uh, up through 2018, I think that cover all the different aspects. Andrew's been doing a really good job of, of filling in uh, what that is. Uh, one of the more recent ones that I read had to do with uh, various hypotheticals and, uh, of the situation in which uh, a piece of technology that you use, whether it be your phone, a tablet, or a laptop, um, was lost. You know, And under what circumstances would that loss uh, be sort of more understanding and, and, and <laughs> so to speak? And, and it came down to, again, reasonable efforts. Uh, you know, did you include a uh, remote ability to wipe uh, your technology device? Did you have biometric uh, password in place? Uh, was, uh, was, as Andrew mentioned, is the data even sitting in storage in sitting in an encrypted form where you need a key to actually access it, even if you could access it? Um, you know, and there were a few other things here in the, in the, uh, in the chat, if you don't mind, Tanya. Uh, uh, I think uh, someone mentioned out there about uh, cloud computing, and again, Andrew covered this. Um, but yes, the standard uh, sort of best practice and part of the state bar's model uh, uh, retainer agreement language as well, to have a provision in your retainer agreement regarding the fact that you use cloud-based uh, storage and computing. Because uh, a lot of us may be using Clio, for example. That's a cloud-based piece of technology uh, as well. Uh, so you want to make sure you have that. Another one sort of uh, question is, um, you know, in the larger firms where that have IT departments, uh, does that take care of uh, a lot of the issues? Actually, it, it does. Uh, another, an, an example would be client trust accounting. When I was a prosecutor at the State Bar, I never saw a client trust accounting issue come from a large firm because they have departments that work on that, even though the individual attorney may not have much of any contact with the, with the CTA account. I, as a solo, I manage my own CTA account, but a lot of attorneys who have this, uh, uh, this facility are, don't, and it works just fine. Um, but of course, at the end of the day, as I said earlier, there is a, a, a non-delegable aspect to your duty of confidence. So you should, if you're gonna have other people take care of it and they're sophisticated and they're great, good, but you should be aware of what they're doing. Uh, so that if you're asked something about yeah. it, you're not you're not in the position of saying, uh, "I just thought it was being taken care of." That that will fall short to an investigator or a prosecutor. Um, if I can also say one yeah. thing, hopefully my microphone is a little mm -hmm. better. I saw some people were having problems with my my earpiece microphone, so I switched over for the computer one. But a lot of these rules also apply to your clients as well in this new remote working environment. Of, of having those kind of security in place, having data level security in place, having antivirus uh, encryption and all of those things. And, and so that, that, that flows over not only for your own practice, and obviously we, you know, we don't want to do anything to endanger ourselves, but it's something that a lot of your clients may want to consider a, a, as well. Absolutely, yeah. And 
One other uh, was a question about a deposition. Uh, I think the question, I can't see it right now, but it was something to the effect that uh, the attorney uh, during this pandemic couldn't really get it together on how to do, uh, I guess, a remote deposition. Uh, you know, is that problematic? And I guess this would be a good example of what I was talking about earlier about the fact-based approach. It's not so much that they couldn't figure out how to create the uh, remote deposition or hire a company that could, it's, it's also, I mean, that's one aspect of it. But I think to me, the larger question is, what's gonna be the impact on the client's uh, interests by virtue of that? Is, is, is discovery cutoff coming up and now you're not gonna have a deposition that you needed for your client? That's gonna really be the issue. Technology is not gonna necessarily, in my mind, 90% of the time for an enforcement person, either a prosecuting attorney like I was or an investigator, it's not gonna be the main issue. That's sort of gonna be the, the, uh, the secondary level. The first level is still our basic ethical duties that we've always had and we've known since we were in law school. Right, no, that's, that's really super helpful. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna transition us into um, a discussion about data breaches um, and, and how these duties of confidentiality kick in and what it means if you do have a situation where client information or some other kind of information that you hold um, in your firm um, or that you have a, a cloud service provider or someone else holding, and we'll talk about that, what, what, you, what you need to do and what you need to consider in that situation. Um, and it is, this issue is teed up by the fact it, it, that very recently we have a proposed opinion from COPRAC, from the um, BARS Standing Committee on Professional Responsibility and Conduct, um, We've, we've been talking about a variety of COBRAC opinions here today, but there's a new formal opinion, proposed opinion number 16-0002, which relates to a lawyer's ethical obligations with respect to unauthorized access to client um, information. And uh, let me start just by making this real for people. Um, I'm gonna share my screen. I always have fun when I do this. When I taught my class, it was always, uh, an adventure, hopefully I'll do this right. Um, I hope that people are looking at a story from Variety and maybe my co-panelists can nod if, if we are successfully seeing that, very good. This one um, caused a lot of people I know to freak out a little bit recently. Um, for me, it was no big deal because I see this all the time and I was like, well, of course. But I know a lot of people who uh, said things like this sent chills up my spine. Um, hacked law firm informs clients like Lady Gaga and Bruce Springsteen of data breach. This is a, a firm actually in New York. Um, whoops, and there's, there's the ads. <laughs> All right. Um, it, it, but this was a, a firm, this is a firm in New York that apparently was hacked. We don't really know how. It's one of my things that I don't like about the way that these things get reported. Hack could mean a lot of different things. We don't really know exactly what happened. But one way or another, they were the subject of a cyber attack, which they have um, admitted. They are not denying that, and they have sent out notices. Um, we'll talk more about that kind of thing. But how did they, how do, what's the evidence? So whoever it was, um, actually released an excerpt uh, which, which purported to be from a contract for Madonna's Madame X tour with Live Nation. Um, nobody wants to be in that situation, right? Um, you can only imagine how you would feel if that was you. Um, and so let's talk about what it means. I'm gonna take the share back down. Um, and let's talk about what this opinion from COPRAC says, and it's consistent with what we've seen coming from other bar committees and associations, including the ABA. And so I'm gonna kind of start there. And this um, opinion, by the way, the COPRAC opinion, goes through a number of scenarios about a stolen laptop, um, about a smartphone that um, has been lost and then is recovered, and Ashad mentioned some of these things before. Um, and then uh, the, the final um, scenario that's mentioned in this particular opinion is a situation where someone is outside counsel for a life sciences tech company, and um, they've been working on patents. And while on vacation, this attorney uh, uses a coffee shop to check personal and work emails, and the laptop is not encrypted. Um, and instead of using their VPN, they use the public Wi-Fi. And again, this has been the subject of earlier COPRAC opinions as well. Um, you know, 
you're imagining a, it's a Starbucks Wi-Fi or something free Wi-Fi, maybe not even as good as a Starbucks. Um, and that uh, unknown to patrons, a hacker had set up a fake internet portal that resembled the one provided by the coffee shop. So it's uh, it's it's um, not safe Wi-Fi. And um, uh, in any event, they returned to the coffee shop the next day and they noticed a sign warning patrons about the fake internet portal. When they returned to the office, they have someone on their IT team, so this question came up earlier, look at the laptop and the team concludes that someone has accessed files on the laptop, right, because they can look at that from a forensic point of view. Um, and those include information related to the patents that they were working on um, while they were on the fake internet network. Um, and since on that day, uh, the attorney was not reviewing those particular files. They weren't looking at those files, but it looks like they were accessed on that day. It appears reasonably likely that an unauthorized user was, was in the file. So that's a good example of a situation where there's something a little more to suggest that there really has been unauthorized access. And this is an issue that we struggle with as um, data security lawyers, whenever a, a client, and it doesn't matter whether we're talking about a law firm or another kind of company, is, has um, had some sort of a phishing attack where people might have been in the system and we're not really sure and we don't always have good evidence and we go to forensics and we don't always know, you're never, you're very rarely going to be able to prove the negative, right? Um, but in this case, uh, there's actual suggestion based on what the IT department has looked at that there's been unauthorized access. So I, I, I give that example as the background of what we then have coming from these bar associations telling us what we're supposed to do. So ABA, it's formal opinion number 18483, which is uh, the title is Lawyers' Obligations After an Electronic Data Breach or Cyber Attack. And so again, we're going to have this language about reasonable efforts. Lawyers must employ reasonable efforts to monitor technology and office resources that are connected to the internet, um, other external data sources, vendors. So it's not enough if you know that you are working um, with a vendor, for example, and your data is on the cloud. It's not enough to just trust that it's all okay. You have to get a, at least a, a baseline level of comfort that um, you feel like you're, there's reasonable security there. Now, how do you do that? As a practical matter, there are a number of different ways to do that. One is, who are you using? Are you using Microsoft? Or are you using, you know, IT is us, uh, or I, whatever, you know, some fly-by-night company that you don't know anything about? Are they insured? Um, do they, what do they say in your agreement about their security? Even if you are, getting a, a, a very cheap cloud service these days, you can tell a lot based on what, are, what the standard terms are and if they say something about security. Because if it's a Microsoft or a Google even, they're going to say something about it, whereas you might have to push another smaller provider. Um, is the company that you're working with more capable of handling security than you think you are personally, right, and, or your practice? Um, those are the kinds of questions to ask. Can you completely delegate that to someone in IT? You can partially do that. An IT person who is um, sophisticated enough, as, as was said before, to give you a sense of what, you know, if, if they've looked at the controls and they trust it or it has multi-factor authentication or whatever it has. But at the end of the day, you are the lawyer and you're the one who has to know whether it meets up to your standard of how to secure uh, your client's information and meet that confidentiality requirement. So that's number one, making reasonable efforts to monitor the technology. Same thing with the public Wi-Fi. Don't use public Wi-Fi. Never a good idea, right? I mean, that's just easy. I have to say, don't use public Wi-Fi. Um, that doesn't mean that you can't find certain kinds of publicly available Wi-Fi that might have more protection associated with them. Also, by the way, if you're using a VPN, you can log into public Wi-Fi and then go into your VPN and have more protection. There's a difference. There are layers of protection there, right? Um, what do you do if a breach is suspected? This, uh, the ABA says lawyers must act reasonably and promptly to stop the breach and mitigate damage, right? So again, having your internal people look to see, have we stopped the bleeding? This is also true for, um, 
for any organization, right? Because there are data breach notification laws, this is where I spend my time, that impact not just lawyers and ethical responsibilities, but when certain kinds of information, like a name with a social security number or a name with a driver's license. So by the way, if you're a lawyer and you handle those kinds of information, because for example, you, um, you do uh, class actions and you get spreadsheets full of people's driver's license numbers or social security numbers. Hopefully you're not doing that anymore. It's not a good idea to put all that stuff in writing, but if it is, or you're getting it from your client and you have a breach, you may have separate obligations to notify, not just ethical, but based on the, the state, um, including California, breach notification laws that say when that kind of information is subject to unauthorized access, you have to notify the affected individuals. So then you're supposed to investigate, of course. You can't just ignore it, so no head in the sand, right? Lawyers do not have the option to just pretend. Um, and, you know, credit to a law firm like the one that was the subject of that variety report um, that they obviously didn't do head in the sand. They, uh, they did acknowledge it, they did take steps. Um, we hear stories in my world, uh, maybe they're fabricated, maybe they're not, about law firms who get you know, greeted by the FBI, get a call, get a visit, saying we have reason to think that you know, your systems, because it can come to you that way too, you can hear from law enforcement sometimes. Um, and sometimes you never, see anything about that, right? Is it, it has become more common for lawyers and law firms to disclose when these things happen, but I think often there has been a sort of um, willful, I, mean, I was about to say willful blindness, that's a little strong. There's been a little bit of uh, blissful ignorance, shall I say, uh, or attempt at blissful ignorance uh, to try to deny when these things happen, and that's just not an option from, with respect to your ethical obligations. Um, and so, as they say uh, in the ABA opinion, just as you would need to assess which paper files have been accessed, you also have to make reasonable attempts to determine what electronic files have been accessed if you have this issue. So, if I was the outside lawyer advising this firm in this scenario here, the patent situation, I would say that's great. Your IT folks have figured out that something happened. Most likely, there's been access, but we don't really know what was accessed for sure. Let's retain an independent forensics firm that can't be accused of a conflict of interest, right, to help you. And let me also just add that um, it is uh, uh, not necessarily going to break you because if you haven't looked into cyber insurance, which you can get as a law firm to help you cover the costs related to these things, you should talk to your insurance broker you should look at what, what's available to you as far as coverage for, for um, both the out-of-pocket expenses and then potential claims if you have one of these situations. And if you have coverage for the out-of-pocket costs, that ordinarily includes forensics to investigate. Um, so that's what ABA says. And what California says, you know, ultimately is very um, similar. At the end of the day, um, they align uh, uh, pretty closely with the ABA, um, but what they say is, as far as disclosure, if you have to notify clients, right, because you have some reason to think that there has been, um, and they refer to, for example, in the duty of disclosure, they refer to uh, Rule 1.4A3 and Business Professions Code Section 6068M, which says um, attorneys have to keep their clients reasonably informed about significant developments. Um, relating to the attorney's representation of the client. And they acknowledge that there aren't rules or case law that clearly define what events are significant, um, but uh, the relevant authorities, they say, have concluded that the misappropriation, destruction, or compromising of client confidential information uh, or a cyber breach that has significantly impaired the, abil the lawyer's ability to provide services is a significant development. And they cite to the ABA opinion I was mentioning to a New York State Bar ethics opinion from 2010, which is number 842, which involved a data breach with a cloud storage provider. It's another good one to look at. Um, in any event, uh, ultimately, if you do have to notify clients, you must do it as soon as reasonably possible, which is very similar to what a lot of the other state data breach notification laws say. Um, and uh, and then, you know, 
think doing things like changing passwords, notifying your clients that they may need to change passwords, depending on what has been accessed, it can get complicated. There's no sort of one size fits all rule in this context for what you have to um, tell the client and what kinds of direction you should provide. Um, but uh, they say it's reasonable for a lawyer through uh, the use of a security expert to ascertain the nature of the event and the potential breach before communicating. And I say not only is it reasonable, it is highly recommended that you consult and get information about what actually happened before you actually communicate. Um, you don't want to, for example, tell everybody everything is okay, we fixed it, and then have it turn out that there's still somebody out there messing around with data. So we are um, unfortunately at the end of our hour, and I know I do know that there's been um, some additional uh, questions. I think let me just pull up the Q and A here again. Um, let's see, maybe they were all. Oh no, there was one here. Um, we have a fundamental question. Uh, oh, this is about emails. Um, I'm actually going to, um, and I know we've run out of time. I, I will do this one question, and then I'll encourage people if they have additional questions to follow up with us um, separately. But one last one here. Um, it is customary, if not required, to include a disclaimer protecting privacy at the bottom of emails when sent to clients to protect against inadvertent or other distribution. Um, is it advisable when sending drafts of things like uh, declarations and answers to discovery that have to be verified to the client to include such a disclaimer in easily visible parts of the page of preliminary drafts is interesting, so in attachments. I might ask uh, Ashad for his thoughts on this one. You're I think you're muted. Yeah, no, I'm there sorry. You go. I saw this question earlier. I'm not sure. Maybe I didn't understand it when I first read it because I thought they were talking about the disclosures, disclaimers that come at the bottom of emails. Right. Um, so I think what the person is asking is is if um, if you have an attachment like a, a document you're sending, should you also put those disclaimers in the actual document and not just in the cover email? I think that's what the question is getting yeah, at. Yeah, I mean overall in in general, I think once disclaimed, that disclaimer is effective. Uh, whether it's in every single part of the document is, uh, I think, is, is not necessary in my opinion. Although, again, it's going to be a fact-specific uh, analysis. If there's some particular reason why that makes sense to do in, in, in a particular case, then there's nothing wrong with doing so for, uh, by any means. Uh, but if the issue is just to um, have made those disclaimers that you feel are important to make in, in the various emails that you send, I think making them as part of the email um, means that they're also part of the document because nowadays uh, an email is essentially a cover letter. Right, uh, that makes sense. And I'm just going to add one final thing. We've had several questions about this. There's been a lot of questions about email encryption, things like that. Again, lawyers do not have to encrypt every single email. I would tell you that if you're if you've got documents again that have other kinds of sensitive information in them, like social security numbers, driver's license, um, stuff that hopefully you don't, you know, payment card information you should never have. Like you should be outsourcing. If you're accepting payments by credit card, you should be outsourcing that and using some sort of third party to process your payments. And there are services to do that for lawyers. If you have that stuff in email, though, you should encrypt. And you can use something. Someone mentioned TLS which is just one, you know, form, use one of the mainstream email encryption programs that are out there. There are many of them. And again, cost is not so difficult. And remember, the email is still going to have to be decrypted when your client receives it. So it doesn't remain encrypted constantly all the time, um, but it does help to get you closer to protecting um, that reasonable security standard with that kind of information and may also help to protect you from uh, litigation under other laws like the new California uh, privacy law that Andrew mentioned earlier. Yeah, go ahead, Andrew. Just as an explanation for those folks who may not be familiar, but when you get those communications from the bank and they have it in an encrypted email and then you have to download it, I, I think that's, that, that's, that's, that's a TLS a example of a TLS. It's it, it's something that's above and beyond, and as, as Tanya said, it's not it's not commonly used, but there may be circumstances, as, you know, based on on the opinions that we've seen out there, you know, where you have that very highly sensitive information that you want to protect, where it could be appropriate. Right, and and on a on a final note, um, you cannot 
um, delegate all responsibility li and liability, I should say, for a potential breach to your cloud service provider, regardless of whether you're a lawyer or not a lawyer. Um, they, they will have limits of liability in their contract that will be very difficult to negotiate. And you, at the end of the day, are primarily responsible because it's your data that's coming into you from your clients. They're just a service provider in that respect. Um, and uh, you, sh you can try to get something that says if they have a breach and it's their fault that they're going to indemnify you. But it's going to be very hard, especially if you're a solo. And so my best advice, again, is insurance on that front, um, not legal advice. This is just all the usual disclaimers. I'm just giving you information. Uh, cyber insurance for lawyers is a really good way to help as well. So I want to thank Ashad. I want to thank Andrew. Um, thank you all for being here. And please do follow up with questions uh, to each of us if you'd like um, independently. And have a great rest of your week. Thank you.